Can you post the Jabber link in the WebEx chat? Hey, Glenn, say something. Your video is fine. That'll do. Hey, Glenn. Good morning. Okay. Yeah, I'll post the Jabber link. Let me just pull up the agenda for today. Hopefully, it should be pretty simple since uh, we don't have a lot of presentations. In fact, we have zero. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got to get the Cody. So we will need note takers and JabberScribe. Yeah. I don't know if Ben's willing to do it again, but what was that handy? Boy, was he good at it too. I mean, yeah. really, really well done notes. Yeah. All right, how does that look? Viewable. Awesome. Okay, and then that burns. Your your audio is a little bit choppy there, sir, or muddled. Oh, sorry. Maybe because there's, I was actually kind of mumbling. So is that clearer? That is clearer. Okay, good. I was turning Whereas to the side and mumbling. So those two things are not very good. See, my excuse is that's just how I talk. It's not really <laughs> Radio decorum. Okay, I see people are slowly trickling in. Hey, WebEx, if you're listening, it'd be really nice if in the breakout Zoom or the breakout participants window, you can make it bigger instead of just showing four people at a time. I wish I had an option for side by side participant list and chat list. There is a crazy idea. We've already covered time zones significantly across the world. 
Good evening, Mark Andrews. Good morning, Glenn Dean. <laughs> Good morning. Buddy. Well, I suspect that while this particular session is time zone friendly for the UK and Eastern US, um, I think that the future time zones, especially the, the Bangkok one, will be much more friendly towards Asia Pacific. I am already planning on sleeping in my office all week of uh, ATF. Because in part, I'm likely to get more sleep in my office than I would if I were at home trying to sleep during the day with seven year old twins there. <laughs> Yeah, that's the hardest. That's what I found to be really hard with the last ITF um, was I was doing, you know, the ITF sessions during ITF time zone, but then the rest of my life was still on California time. And so I was still. Glenn, the parent, yeah, I sorry to interrupt, but Paul just indicated in the um, hang on. We have to rip off a message to the mailing list. The um, WebEx link didn't go to the mailing list. You want to take care of that or? Yeah. That's odd. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but since this is kind of vital for people that are now looking for how to join. Well, let me in fact let me send the link directly just to the, the meetings. Um, oh, I I subscribe to the IATF calendar, so it, yeah, it, I think there it's was just a, there. Um, there was a glitch this morning with uh, the IATF calendar and time zone entries for this particular ICS. Somebody raised it like about an hour ago. So, and, and, and uh, Henrik has already fixed it apparently. So, <laughs> last one was, it was at somebody had forgot to set the time zone for something at some point. Yeah, oh, so yeah, yeah. Lars mentioned that, that it, there was no time zone. And so it looked like it was. 1 p.m. no matter where you were. It doesn't work well. Um, Bangkok starting the day at midday, though, doesn't really help me all that much. It moves everything to my evening because it's already three hours and then there's another three hours. It puts it six hours back in the day for me. So do we just need to establish the, the official ITF time zone where it's just it's ITF time and, and we just live on it? <laughs> okay, so I just dropped to the mailing list uh, the reference to the um, meeting page. And we're at the very top since we're on today. Isn't the official uh, ATF time zone GMT for uh, Shorty Glenn? <laughs> That's a very UK centric historical view of the time zone. It's yeah, UTC. <laughs> now, I think you find it was originally a GMT, uh, and most of the world is still coloured pink uh, on the maps, I think. Even in the colonies, uh, Glenn. <laughs> okay. My computer is just informing me at six o'clock. So, how are we doing for um, participants? Um, I think we barely have any because you didn't send out the meeting, the URL in the meeting notice. I'm seeing very few people in Jabber. Yeah, we definitely, um, because of this cock up plan, I think we have to give it a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm looking at the attendees list. Looks like we have 28 so far. And I just got a copy of the mail I sent, so it did hit the list. Oh. 
church tower is now telling me that it's the top of the hour. So. While we are waiting, does anybody who has made it so far uh, want to volunteer to help us out and either be a note taker? You can have more than one. Uh, more than one is always welcome. Uh, or a Jabber scribe. I uh, a little bit. I'm going to end up falling asleep during this. Yeah. Last me. I back now, so I just. Like it. Uh, <laughs> it was that exciting. <laughs> no. <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Today we're going to talk Andrew, about the so Andrew is going to do um, Jabber for us again. And I actually had dropped a private message over to Ben, who I don't, maybe has not seen it yet. And I don't know if he's in the WebEx yet. Let's see. Ben is not on the WebEx. Oh, he is in Jabber. Yes, I am. Oh, great. <laughs> and and so, have you considered my offer of uncompensated mm -hmm. accolades for? Again, not to put you too much your time, offer, but they were excellent notes. So, yeah. yeah, the last last meeting looked to be very good, as much as I saw of them. They were really well done. <laughs> ben Ben set a new standard for or for note taking. I think for for ADD. Yep, best notes we've ever seen anywhere ever. <laughs> Flattery, which I think will get us everywhere for this. It's almost like we were there. Well, I can uh, I can help with, I can help with notes, but I don't think I can do it alone. Yes. Can we have a second helper to jump in and help Ben, please? Remember, this is your chance to, to choose the correct use of your and, 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 and keep the people really passionately feel strongly about the correct use of or and its. Um, this is your chance to show your skills. Impress I'll, I'll your... help out with the minutes. Uh, okay. It's Chris Box. Thank you, Chris. But this is a chance to show what your third grade teacher taught you. So and 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 uh, show it well. So do not get the apostrophe in the wrong place. Okay. So we have two notes takers: Ben Schwartz with the assistance of Chris Box. Uh, we have a Jabber scribe through Andrew Tampley. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and uh, it's we have thirty nine participants, and I, th I think more will trickle in. So I, I suggest we we get started with the. The high level stuff, especially so that people in in time zones where their body's saying it's time to go to bed, uh, we maybe get through this a little bit early and let them go to bed a little bit earlier than they expected. Um, so, hi, I'm Glenn Dean. I am one of your co chairs, along with David Lawrence of the ADD uh, working group. Uh, you're the area director is Barry Leva, and well, you know the rest. Let me get focus here. Please be aware that this meeting uh, is an ICF official meeting and it is subject to note well. Anything, any submissions here fall under the note well terms. Uh, we are using WebEx for this session. So like the previous sessions, uh, mm. in WebEx, we're gonna use the format of doing plus Q and minus Q in the WebEx chat to uh, get yourself added to the discussion. Uh, please use the Jabber room uh, for other discussions and keep the uh, WebEx session chat uh, free just for uh, the queuing, please. Uh, also, we have uh, notes being taken over there uh, on Etherpad or intended by ProMed. So this is the agenda for today. It's very high level, uh, and I'll show you the, the authentication topics a page in a second so we can bash those. Uh, but we uh, coming out of the session number one uh, last week, authentication uh, based upon conversations on lists, uh, contributions in, in various documents, and uh, contributions in the Jabber chat uh, really showed that authentication and, and the bigger topic of authentication in a lot of different places uh, was something that was of concern to people and would like some more clarification. 
And so we've essentially dedicated this session to, to just talking about fabrication subtopics. And there's the chairs, there's the things. So uh, based upon the mailing list and based upon um, the query I put out on Friday for input on suggestions and some other things, I pulled together uh, the following eight subtopics for discussion on authentication. Uh, technically there's seven, uh, and at the very end there's the number eight, which says, uh, are there any other topics that need to be considered? And so hopefully that will allow us to uh, have enough freedom, uh, but at any major topic on around authentication that people think that we need to talk about today does get covered. Uh, and that is the agenda for today, these eight lines. Uh, is there anything that people would like to uh, request to remove or to add to this list? Can I suggest that uh, people might want to mute if they're not talking? There's quite a lot of background noise. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so here I had a question. Oh. Go yes. ahead. Um, when we're talking about authentication here, are we considering the, re the reduced scope of the single use case, or are we considering beyond that? Okay, uh, before saying... we answer that question, I want to point out two things. I appreciate the question, Chris. Um, but one of the slides that Glenn just blew right past was we are going to again be doing queue management through the WebEx chat, to which Tommy Polly has added himself to the queue. Chris, I mean, we'll handle your question Sorry. first. But um, do let's, you know, be doing this plus queue, minus queue if you um, want mic time, please. Thank you. So, Chris or Glenn, finish up your answer for Chris's question and then we'll move on to Tom. Uh, to answer your question, Chris, I think this is still looking at the, the full scope. Uh, the the single use case uh, proposal that's uh, being discussed on the list, I don't think it's come to cl closure yet. And so we're still looking at the big picture. Great. Thank you. Tommy, please. Yeah. Could we go back to the list of questions? Yeah. So I, I think it's fine to go with this list. My one suggestion would be that as far as the order, it may be useful to talk about the attacker model number five prior to getting into should DHCP play a role, because that is really dependent on the answer to number five. That seems reasonable. Anybody uh, want to jump in the queue and argue with that? Yeah, uh, Ecker, please. Yeah, I, I don't think. I don't think I want to. I think. I think, well, I think if we're gonna. The DHCP question is contingent not just on the not just on, authentic, not just on the authentication model, but also on the deployment model. And so I guess I don't know how you people want to manage that because, um, as, as I put out on the list, um, it's pretty common to have um, user provided customer premises equipment between you and the um, carrier provided customer premises equipment. And there's no particular reason to think it's going to pass unknown DHCP options. So, um, like. I don't understand how to answer the DTP question unless we have like established what the what the what the what the deployment model is. Um, uh, with respect to the question of um, uh, of authentic uh, of the of the uh, use model, whether it's the single use cases, Martin pointed out, or others, uh, as Chris suggested, uh, as far as I can tell, the authentication situation for the uh, use cases that are not the local deployment use cases, like most of the ones. That, um, in uh, the sort of ones that were unique to the active DNS um, is actually relatively straightforward. <laughs> and so um, I think it would be probably more useful to talk about the local authentication cases, even if you think that you, the other cases should be in scope for our work. So, Ecker, if I, if I can tease out of that, the, you're, you're agreeing with movie number five up to the first thing we discuss? Sure, if you want to reduce five points to one. <laughs> um, I, I, sorry, there was a lot. There was a lot to decompress right there. <laughs> De I'm back. So, um, so, so, to be clear, move number five up, and then what else do you, would you yes. like to? So, I don't think we can address the DHCP issue unless we previously discuss what deployment model we intended to deploy in, because that tells you whether it's even technically feasible, regardless of authentication. And second, I think while I don't think we have to decide the question of which use cases. We're interested. I think for the purpose of this discussion, it is most useful to focus on the local use cases because the other use cases actually have much more straightforward authentication stories. Okay. All right then. Um, so um, let, let's take the rest of the, the, the agenda bash queue here. Dave, you want to manage this? Michael Richardson, please. 
Hi. Does it work? No. Yeah, yeah. We okay. I was a little sure quiet, though. I wasn't sure if the press space bar actually worked now. Um, so I think I'm agreeing with Eckerd, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess I would ask the question um, about number two is, can the client, does the client know how to authenticate the network a priori? And I think that it's a similar statement, but I don't know if it's the same question. Okay. Uh, does any, you want to address that, Glenn, or? Um, well, that, that's, that, <laughs> I think it's something the group needs to discuss because it, it comes back to Eckhart's point of what deployment environments are you working in, right? Uh, right. That, that, that might actually be substantive discussion on the item itself, so. Right. Um, okay, uh, Paul Hoffman, please. Um, so just to bring up one thing that's related to um, five and others that people seem to think was an okay thought last week is uh, which, you know, what are we assuming for trust anchors? Um, we either have a trust anchor that the user is already holding or a trust anchor that they got through some unauthenticated mechanism. And those certainly relate to DHCP and such, but I'm not saying that that should be a separate item, but I think that that has to be part of certainly five because, you know, we don't know how the attacker is, you know, like, like if the attacker can do something that can um, push a trust anchor to you, that's completely different. So I, let, let's put, I, just, again, not as a separate item, but please put that into the consideration. Okay, Glenn, that was the current cue. Okay, and then Paul Winters, I see made a comment. Paul, do you want to you want to jump in and make the comments everybody can because I don't know if people are following the chat. Uh, sorry, okay. I, I just wanted to make a note that uh, in re response to Michael's question, like like no, you cannot really like any network name has a name and it's public knowledge because otherwise you can't see or join it. And so anyone can take that name and usually you only have a name as an identifier to the network you're joining if you're on Wi-Fi. So names are just not enough. So you can never know what network you're joining, if it's rogue or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so uh, what I'm teasing out of that is we really should start with number five. There's a number of sub elements that number five drives us to consider. And I think Ecker listed them out. So if people want to have a record of that that they can refer to, go look at the uh, notes in the Etherpad because they captured the, the list that Eckhart said. Um, and so let's juggle the, the discussion order and start with number five. Uh, so I, I, this is meant to be a discussion, not, not a, a, a chairs led thing. So let us open up the floor to uh, discussion about this particular topic space. And we'll capture your, your comments and then um, when the conversation seems to sort of reach a natural, either we're starting to repeat ourselves or, or strain off things, uh, we'll pull it back in and, and, and refocus it on the next question. Uh, the one thing I will suggest is, uh, you know, th this conversation, especially in the local discovery, uh, can possibly start straining us into some other aspects about uh, network um, bootstrapping models that are sort of like, you know, well, wouldn't it be nice if, and that would be sort of A, out of scope for the ADD group and probably a much bigger rat's hole for us to try to actually do productive work and do. So let's stick to stuff that we that we can actually do today or that is near term that we can do, That's my suggestion. And with that, I'll, I'll stop talking. Andrew Camplin, please. All right, just to uh, say on the mic, uh, what I've said on, on Jabba, um, just picking up on on uh, Eka's point about the sort of local network environment, which is obviously linked to this. Um, certainly in the UK, I think many other European markets, the ISP provides a uh, uh, sort of a router or router even for uh, those in the US uh, with um, Sort of Wi-Fi capability, etc. So uh, um, I, I think it would be reasonable to say that the majority of uh, uh, consumer users and probably SME users are likely to be using 
IFP provided kit, albeit they're perfectly at liberty to either unplug the ISP kit completely if they wish, or indeed to connect their own kit to augment its capabilities. But uh, the default is they'd be using the ISP provided kit. They don't need, in most cases, to provide anything else. Um, so I just wanted to add that to the sort of thought process around, uh, if you like, the environment in which the local discovery needs to happen. Thank you, Andrew. Ben Schwartz, please. Hi, Ben Schwartz. I, on this topic, I think rather than trying to decide which capabilities an attacker could have or could not have, uh, I think that we are going to have to address a, a pretty wide variety of potential attacker models and, and provide things that, you know, some solutions will work in some models and some will, will not be secure in some of those models. Uh, so rather than trying to reach consensus on which attacks are in scope or out of scope, that what would be most helpful for me is to have a taxonomy of the attacks so that when we are developing solutions, we, we can have a shared understanding of which attacks are, uh, are prevented or, or not prevented by each proposed solution. Great, thank you. Uh, Ecker? Yeah, um, I think to three points. Um, one, uh, to follow up on what Andrew said, um, it's reasonably common in the United States as well for um, ISPs provide, uh, uh, um, you know, a Wi-Fi capable access points uh, or CPE. But on the other hand, um, it's also quite common for customers to plug in their own uh, CPE um, to the to that CPE, um, especially if they want to have, for instance, a Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi mesh system or something like that. Um, so I think perhaps the question that what the supplementary here is what level of success is one interested in. Um, so, for instance, if Enter the majority, so thirty percent of people provide their own CPE, and it doesn't work on those people. Is is seventy percent success a good success rate or a bad success rate? Um, so I think that's probably one thing we should be understand. I, I just made those numbers up, obviously. Um, uh, um, second, um, I think with respect to Ben's uh, uh, um, uh, suggestion, um, certainly I, I think that, that, that there's certainly going to be a variety of, of situations, but um, you know if we have 25 different threat models and also 25 different protocols to meet the threat models, then we're going to be here a really, really, really long time. Um, so my point would be if there's not at least one threat model which occupies a fairly large fraction of the people and which has a solution which does something useful in that situation, then like probably like we should be taking a step back and thinking about it. Um, and what I really don't want to see is a situation in which like we have a pilot, which I have a set of solutions, which, um, you know, uh, um, each of which is bad in some threat model and, 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 and none of which occupies a big enough threat model space to be useful. Thank you, Ecker. Kiru, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, uh, so <clears throat> Kiru from Mekasi. So uh, I just wanted to add to what Ecker was saying that uh, uh, nowadays, we see many of the uh, security vendors are offering uh, network system security services from home routers. Uh, it could be an off-the-shelf home router, or it could be uh, co-located with the ISP provided uh, CPE. Uh, in both the cases, if you see, uh, uh, it's not just from like a CPE offers a CPE home platform, uh, which offers uh, network security services, DNS filtering, uh, device isolation, various other security features to protect the home network. These routers are quite advanced, that we see that it's quite easy for us to upgrade the firmware or configuration on these routers. And uh, uh, whatever mechanism the working group decides, either DSCP or a new resource record type or a special, especially other in domain name, it would be quite easy for us to update the configuration of firmware to support that and uh, help the client discover the network provider to resolve in those cases. So what we have seen in deployments is we have seen models where uh, uh, we have seen legacy routers, which are uh, quite unupgradable. And they have to rely on the ISP's uh, resolver for, uh, let's say, uh, for entire home provide malware filtering, and they cannot uh, rely anything on the uh, home networks uh, to, uh, to offer any security services. And we also see uh, home routers having this capability so that they can get uh, protection under first of it. <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you very much, Tiru. Uh, the one thing I was aware of as I was also watching the notes, and this is um, meant in a very friendly way to everybody. Um, please remember that our note taker is heroic, but it does help to kind of pace your speaking a little so they can keep up. Uh, so with that, uh, Paul Hoffman again, please. So I will disagree with Ben Schwartz strongly on the way forward. Um, lots of people have proposed things, including me, that did not have clearly stated use cases. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, lots of people have proposed um, solutions without clearly stated use cases. And I put myself in that category. Um, the result of that so far, because look, we've been we've been doing this for like a year now. Um, is that people attack it because, you know, the solution, because it doesn't meet their use case, or they support it because if you stretch it a little bit in this direction, it does meet their use case. And so far, this is this has led to no progress at all. I strongly believe we should do it based on use cases and attack scenarios. And I think those two here are quite related. The use case is I want to get X in this environment. The statement of this environment, even if you don't remember all the attackers in the environment, certainly other people on the list will throw some at you, um, leads to either, um, to, well, will definitely lead to two things. One, it will lead to this proposal meets the use case, and two, this proposal meets the use case except for these kind of people, and we've been talking about the, these kind of people, people who put in their own Wi-Fi, people who are using the company Wi-Fi, which might stomp on things, stuff like that. So preference towards use case and uh, environment first and then proposal. Thank you, Paul. Jim Reed, please. Thanks, guys. I'll try to speak slowly and I apologize for the accent for the note taker. Thank you, I Jim. kind of agree with what Ben and Ecker have said, and to a large extent with what Paul has done too. I would suggest the way forward here is that we should try to gather as many of the use cases as possible. Let's set a deadline for that. Let's say, for example, towards the end of the year, maybe say at the next ITF meeting would be a suitable point. So it should be incumbent on the people in the working group to come up with a use case and just a couple of sentences about the threat model or the potential problems that this use case might throw up. And then once we've got all that information together, we can then take a look at this in the, in the labs and say, well, that particular solution is out of scope for us, or it's going to take too long, or it's too complicated, we don't understand it, and then make engineering decisions about which ones are the ones we can work on and achieve solutions in a reasonable amount of time. I think at the moment we're going around in circles quite a lot. And I think it would help greatly if we have some deadlines and some focus by saying, let's get all the use cases together by a specific date and with some outlines of the threats that these pose, then have a discussion about those kind of issues and then think about how we work from there on forward. Because I think at the moment we're just going round and round and we're not really making a lot of progress. Right. Thank you very much, Jim. And and just for people that are unaware of our relationship, since a comment came up in chat, we're, we're, we're everybody's accent is just fine. We're just uh, a little a little friendly Scots humor there. Um, Paul Ratters, please. Sorry, I just um, uh, I want to make two comments. One is that uh, it, it seems people are thinking a lot about the ISP scenario where the ISP gives some equipment or not and you connect to it. But um, that leaves out a lot of all the mobile devices that have uh, 5G or, or 4G connections straight up where the control is a lot different, the security is a lot different. Um, and I just want to make sure that people are thinking about that too. Um, another comment was um, uh, to say um, my own CPE equipment that I uh, happen to have changed last month 
um, came with a, a password of admin uh, that I could change everything with except the DNS settings. For the DNS settings, I then had to type in the serial number of the device to, uh, to make changes to it. So, so people are definitely trying to make things more secure. But on the other hand, I think like it's also clear that most networks people connect to are untrusted. And so it always comes down to just give the information and let the, the connecting uh, entity make their own security decisions based on it. And, and if you look at like what Mozilla is doing, I think it, it's already moving in that direction, not even for the entire device, but for applications on the device. So I would like the discovery model to more focus on getting the information to the user and letting the user make those decisions. And whether or not you can secure this later on, that would be great if we can do that, but it should not prevent the, the publication of this information so that the user can make a decision if they want. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Kiru again, please. Hello. Uh, I'll try to be slow this time. Um, so I see I see two different types of networks that uh, I think we've been discussing. One is uh, home networks or uh, uh, free Wi-Fi networks where uh, uh, the users log into a, a message ID that is well known to everybody and uh, users typically use a common password. And that seems to be a problem that the user uh, may not even know whether uh, the user is indeed connecting to the home network or it could be an evil twin. Uh, but in case of uh, enterprise networks, it would be typically that the user would get any credentials, would end up using a talk to .NX and any of the EAP methods, and it could be an unique username password or it could be an unique certificate that you could get. And uh, in that case, the endpoint does know that it can uh, it is actually connecting to the intended organization's network and not to any evil thing. So I think I think in those two cases, the attack vectors are quite different. So I, I think that would help probably to understand each of these use cases, like uh, someone has mentioned previously, to explain uh, the threat uh, models that would be applicable to, for example, a free Wi-Fi network or a, or a home network or an enterprise network to understand uh, uh, if you have can have a uh, discovery mechanism that would work in one or more of these use cases. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Kiru. Um, Tommy Polly, please. Unless uh, one quick question, Glenn, do you want to take a priority chair leap? Okay, Tommy Polly, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, we we're talking about the deployment model a lot. Um, you know, the question here that Eckerd raised was around kind of what's the attacker model. So I'd like to discuss a bit about that. Um, so I, I'd send a mail in response on the list. So I guess I like to throw out as a straw man, kind of like an attack, attacker model we can talk about. So I, it seems to me that it's useful to talk about an attacker that can inject observe your DNS packets so that can be someone on your local network or otherwise who's trying to get you to look at their encrypted DNS server, but they aren't a full man in the middle for DHCP. Um, because like, I think there are cases in which if you're providing all of the DHCP and RAs, you're essentially a router in an untrusted network, that's not gonna help us at all. And then there are models on the other end in which I have a VPN and I'm trusting my provisioning entirely. That's also pretty simple. So it seems like if we're going to do anything that is not just based in the provisioning mechanism that has some kind of new requirements on authenticity, it would be around validating that this new DOE or encrypted resolver I have is related to the thing I got over DHCP, assuming that I want to use a resolver. But I guess I'd like to hear if people have um, disagreements with that attacker. Well. Okay, thank you, Tommy. Wes Hardiker, please. Yeah, the one, the one I think thing that I keep thinking about as I'm listening to this discussion is that we are in the camp of, you know, we're letting perfect be the enemy of the good to a large extent. It takes a long time to be perfect. And, you know, even things like DHCB can be useful across boundaries given equipment rollover times that you're getting faster and faster. 
Um, you just have to take that into consideration when you're building a longer term plan. So the result is, you know, you have to build a timeline with respect to a rollout. And uh, there seem to be sort of two solution timelines that keep getting talked about. One is what can we accomplish now, right? That the ATF is always trying to come up with protocols that work within the current environment. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> sometimes that means, you know, what can we do within a browser update, which is a really convenient, short, you know, often three month kind of time timeline. Um, but, you know, there's also the vision of what can you do with a longer term. And I think you've got to consider even the possibility that there are multiple approaches with a fallback mechanism for, you know, well, DHCP isn't passing anything, therefore I have to go back to another one. And I hate to say that within the IETF because we generally uh, only like to do one solution for, you know, protocol kind of concerns. But there are times when you can't and there are times where, you know, you, you either have, can't wait for something to come out or uh, you have to wait until something comes out. And I think we might be in the camp where we may need to do both. Great, thank you, Wes. And I believe that is exactly what Glenn wants to speak to now as uh, speaking from the chair, trying to direct conversation. Exactly. Um, so from what I've heard from the conversation, which has been pretty good, uh, and, and what I'm also trying to follow the Jabber chat, you know, we seem to be settling around uh, my observation and, and uh, is that we seem to be settling around a, a couple of core use cases. The in-home use case seems to be one that a lot of people are talking about and are comfortable with, with some sort of um, sub cases around it where you may have uh, various attackers. I've seen some proposals here in the Jabber chat about uh, people, you know, doing hinky things uh, such as impersonating your home network. But I think that that's actually a pretty rare occurrence in, in, in the in the wild. Uh, but also we have more complex environments, which such as the uh, the, the mobile space and when you are visiting cafes and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll throw it to the group to, as we shape the discussion here. Uh, maybe when you are raising an issue, raise, uh, tell us which of these environments you're actually directly addressing in your comments. Uh, and maybe as well, uh, give an indication of, do you think that uh, the priority, uh, not the exclusive thing, but the priority should be one or the other, and and, and such as uh, like the comments by West, for instance, um, just to sort of help help us shape and, and, and direct the conversation. Uh, I'll turn my mic mic back off. Uh, thank you, Glenn Ecker, please. Yeah. Um, so, uh. I guess, I, I, fortunately, I don't think the division Glenn proposed works. Um, there's no meaningful way to differentiate between your home network and the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi network that you just joined if they both have passwords. So they're the same thing. Um, and uh, so, so I, I don't I don't understand how that works. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm sort of like, well, frankly, not very enthusiastic with the point was just made. Um, but I guess once again, I'd like to go back to the question I think I raised on uh, uh, on the phone, which is, um, uh, you know, earlier, which is like, what what would you consider success in terms of like, what, uh, in terms of success right now? Um, if that number is 50%, that's one thing, and if number 95%, that's quite another. And so I think we really need to understand the answer to that question, um, regardless of what we think the, uh, of what we think the, uh, 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 the environment is. Um, third, this question that what Tommy was saying, um, I guess I don't really understand what capabilities would lead, what, what, what physical capabilities would lead me to not be able to spoof DCP messages, but would lead me to spoof DNS messages. They're both just raw UDP. So, Tommy, I guess maybe you can explain to me how, how that situation would come to pass. Okay, thank you, Ecker. Uh, Ralph Weber, please. Uh, Ralph Weber, yeah. I also can maybe answer that. I mean, a lot of the enterprise environment. And Ralph, you're a little um, muted. Can you get closer to the mic or speak up? Or... Yeah. Trying. Is it better now? Uh, slightly. Okay. So, um, the the reason why you can ha maybe handle DHCP uh, differently is then in a lot of enterprise environments, switches have guards against from which port you actually can uh, send the DHCP answers, and uh, this might be also in, in some homebars. I don't know. So this is why this is different, but. Then the question I have, which is, I mean, 
why didn't we just do DCP last year? Because I think there was a draft for that. And I would be, especially for the home case, be okay to, to do that uh, because it's probably the, the quickest win for anything. That's it. I was sitting here with my mic muted talking about other people's muted mics. So I'm very oh, sorry about that all. I'm like, why isn't Eric responding? Because I dirt. I'm sorry. Um, Eric Nygren, please. Hit it here up. Um, thanks. The Eric Nygren, Akamai. I think that while some of these problems there's certainly no way to deal with now, and while the scope of solving some of them now is, is certainly not something we want to have as part of the scope of ADD, it would be nice to think about ways and that didn't necessarily preclude some better solutions down, um, down the line. Um, so, for example, what, when Paul was um, listing the categories of things that you um, could get, um, you could use for establishing root of trust. I think another class of those is ones where there's been some association through the real world to establish trust, whether it's like scanning a QR code or pressing a button on the two devices to establishing a pairing. And so there are some ways, even in the in the kind of home network environment or the coffee shop environment, to to do that as trust establishment and. In many cases, you might say this is totally out of scope, where maybe of at least some related interest here is that is given the association between naming and um, and trust establishment, we may um, and how um, naming is a big a big part of what use, users interacting with, with trust. It's something where where we may want to think about it sooner rather than later, even if it's kind of post ADD. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Tommy Pauly, please. Yeah, um, so in response to Ecker's question, I mean, yes, if an attacker can inject UDP, of course they could do DHCP or DNS. Um, they, they still seem a bit different to me. Um, doing the man in the middle attack for DHCP is a much more active thing that you have to do. Some of the models for uh, just injecting one DNS packet to someone to get them to use your some dose server that you choose is a lighter weight attack. Um, as people mentioned, also there are the guards for DHCP and RA that exist somewhere. We can't rely on that all the time, but at least it's something. And then a larger point: if you are already attacking my DCP traffic and are being the man in the middle, you're already choosing my DO53 resolver, and you essentially are already my network provider, and I may as well trust you as much as I trust the network I don't trust any other way, right? You're, you are my uh, cafe network, and maybe it's a legit one, maybe it's a fake one. Um, but I think there are models in which You could attack me in a way that I would have otherwise been better off to just use the DO53 router address that I had, the, the, the resolver address that I had, because that one was legitimate, and now you're redirecting me to something else that is an attacker's encrypted DNS server. So that's really the attack I want to avoid here and say that if you already control the, the unencrypted DNS server, I'm less interested in preventing that attack. Yeah, thank so, you. So, well, Tommy is from the chair. Can, can I ask for clarification for the notes uh, in particular on that point you just made? So, when you say you're not interested in that attack, which specific attack could, could you sort of lay it out so, in, in, from end to end? Right. So, essentially, the attacker that is controlling your network provisioning entirely, right? They've 
injected your DHCP responses or RAs, if they are controlling both the resolver address for unencrypted UDP DNS and the one that you're using for encrypted DNS to do or dot, I, that's an attack I think that we can't solve without some other form of trust um, because they are controlling everything here. Um, so the, the attack I am interested in protecting against is when I would have used a, for whatever value of legitimate you want, legitimate UDP resolver that you're redirecting me to an attacker's encrypted DNS resolver. Okay, so to, to be clear then, so it would be a, uh, a, a the, the, the traditional 53 DNS would be in your scenario, trusted, considered trusted or reliable, but the threat is a uh, DOE server encrypted or an encrypted DNS server that is under control by a nefarious party. Right. The attack is when you get me to go to an encrypted DNS server that is not run by the same entity as the unencrypted DNS server. If they're the same, I, I, I'm not interested in solving that one in this group. Okay, thank you, Tommy. Uh, now, Tiru, please. Sorry, guys, I realized I was on mute. Uh, I, I agree with most of the comments from uh, Tommy, especially because uh, you know, I think the mm -hmm. industry has been uh, dealing with uh, DHCP based attacks for quite a while, and uh, they have security uh, services like DHCP Guard or RA Guard to especially protect from. Uh, 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 these the responses coming from uh, attackers, and uh, that's that's pretty easy to deal with, and we've been doing that. But unfortunately, I agree that the client never knows whether the network has uh, deployed the services. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with Tommy when he says that if the ECP and RA are spoke, that means you're actually connecting to some other access point, and you have no control on whom you're uh, connecting to uh, as a network proxy. Thank you. Thank you, Tiru. Ben Schwartz, please. Hi, Ben Schwartz. I'm not swayed by the arguments about DHCP protection so far, because it seems like any network with built-in DHCP guards could equally well have built-in DNS guards. Uh, so, uh, I don't, that distinction doesn't seem like one that, that we, we should focus on. The, the thing that seems most appealing to me here is to focus on fine grained attacker capabilities. And the two that I brought up on the mailing list are um, transient to persistent upgrades. So it does, are we creating a system where a transient attacker who briefly has the ability to inject packets can become a persistent attacker who gets to capture and modify all of your DNS traffic? And, uh, and also, essentially, where in the network the, the attacker is able to act. And so this, this is, in fact, similar to what Tommy is talking about, maybe from a different perspective where uh, if you have an injection attacker who isn't on your link, but is, for example, uh, on the link upstream of your recursive resolver, then they might be able to inject traffic into the recursive cache, uh, but currently they can't hijack your whole connection. Uh, if we, for example, if we used uh, one of our special use name based proposals that would uh, allow such an injection attacker to become a, a pervasive sur uh, persistent surveillance attacker. So those are the distinctions that I think about. Did it again because I've got truck noise outside my house, so I had to mute myself again. So I'm sorry about that. But um, Eric Orth, please. Yeah, I think the 
one area we keep sort of glossing over in all these discussions is sort of who we're authenticating. It's, there's sort of a, the general concept of, oh, we're supposed to make sure that we're getting this DHCP information or whatever information from whoever is supposed to be getting it. And we haven't really agreed on who that is. And I think a lot of this is use case specific. In a lot of use cases, the client might know specific some specific entity they want to get the information from. Maybe they want it from the ISP. Maybe they want it from a specific enterprise, something like that. And in a lot of those cases, well, this is we have to create the authentication mechanisms for that specific use case. But the underlying auth mechanisms are a fairly easy problem. You know who you want, so you probably have a name for them, and we just got to authenticate that name through DNSSEC or certs or whatever. The uh, the more general case, though, is just sort of, do we authenticate that the network is giving us information that the net from whoever is supposed to be providing information from the network? And I don't think this is really an authentication problem because from the client's perspective, they don't know who that is. They just need to trust the network to control it and only allow through information from the proper sources. But even though this is not authentic, an authentication problem, we still have all the same security issues a lot of people are been talking about, we need to make sure attackers can't replace things with things that weren't allowed to replace it before. And so I think really the only way to protect against this is to stick within communication mechanisms that the network already knows to guard against, things like staying within DHCP as much as possible because the network knows how to control and make sure only the proper network authority is able to give DHCP and be able to block other stuff. But yeah, if you, if, versus if you invent brand new mechanisms, someone can, the network doesn't know to control that and people can get in signals that couldn't get through before. And even though there's no authentic, real authentication story, attackers that didn't have power before now might have power and then we've made security worse. That's all I've got. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, Eckert, please. Yeah, so I, I thought the most interesting thing Tommy said was, um, that's many things are interesting. Was um, that uh, you shouldn't? The the, the idea um, is don't like the, the idea of not uh, allowing this attacker to be the situation worse by stirring a resolve you otherwise wouldn't have used. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, interesting way of framing this because it may, may open up the solution space quite a bit. So I mean, as a concrete example, um, you know, if you're willing to be happy about the IP address. Um, you could simply you could simply do effectively opportunistic probing, and then you, and you wouldn't need a signaling at all. And so the, the so the question is, and what does signaling do? Um, the signaling either tells you well there is a there is a uh, uh, there is an available um, resolver, or um, uh, uh, um, in some some potentially authoritative way, or potentially tells you it's over here instead of over here. Um, so uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, this is fully formed, but I think uh, you know trying to figure out exactly what what we're trying to accomplish um, would be helpful here. Um, another thing worth mentioning um, is uh, that there's a um, <clears throat> that the, the 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 problem with the DHCP guards is the client has no idea whether the DHCP guards are in place or not. And so if the if the DHCP if if you don't if you think DHCP is insecure and um, contra Tommy's opinion, um, then uh, then relying on it doesn't work because you don't know if the guards are in place and therefore you could be forced into something worse. So, um, you know, fine to have mechanisms which um, don't make the system, um, which don't make the system better, but can't make it worse, but having mechanisms which can make the system both better and worse, and then you can't tell what, what, what security is in place, that's no good. Thank you, Ecker. Warren Kamari, please. Thank you. Uh, so two quick things on the DHCP thing. One, um, something which I think we seem to forget is in order for an attacker to do a useful DHCP injection, they almost always have to actually be local to where the client is, right? They need to be on the same layer two network, um, which is a fairly large change from a normal attack model. Um, the other thing is, I guess, worth reiterating that almost all Wi-Fi networks or Wi-Fi kit um, already have DHCP guard type functionality built in, as do almost all switches. Um, they already have it existing and in many cases um, turned on by default. Um, yes, there's no way for the client to know that. I fully agree with Echo. Um, but I think this might be another case of the perfect becoming the enemy of the good. At the moment, we have nothing because we keep getting up in the sort of situation of how do we solve this for everyone? 
and maybe at some point, you know, an initial we can solve it for some set of people some of the time, and that ain't bad. Thank you, Warren. Kiru again, please. Hello. Yeah, I was about to say what uh, Warren was saying, and I totally agree with him. And one thing uh, I like about DHCP is uh, it, since it's not just being local and because of the layer to protection that you get. Uh, in case the DHCP is not available, maybe we should con consider multiple discovery options like giving DHCP higher priority and then falling back to DNS because DNS could be coming from uh, any, any external entity and could be subjected to external attacks. So uh, maybe that uh, uh, fallback mechanism that we consider because I've seen several protocols uh, today supporting uh, several discovery mechanisms and not just one. So uh, I think having multiple discovery mechanisms and having a presence between them would be uh, uh, a way of uh, making progress to handle the various deployment cases that we've been discussing. Uh, whether the home router can be upgraded or cannot be upgraded. Thank you, Kieran. Martin Thompson, please. Yeah, so Ben hinted on something that I think was really kind of interesting. He suggested that he wasn't convinced at all by the DHCP arguments that we've been, been putting forth and the ones that Tommy put, put out, and um, then talked about what abilities does the attacker gain by, by mounting a particular attack. and identified one particular attack with the uh, special use domain names that, that was potentially quite interesting and, and exposes a vulnerability there that I, I think has, has been highlighted as one of the many things that special use domain names have problems with. But with DHCP, I still can't see any specific way that an attacker can gain something that they don't already have if the attacker is able to tell you what your DO53 server is, then it's game up, game over as far as I'm concerned in terms of resolver selection. So I don't know why we would expect a higher degree of security um, for something that we're building here than the configuration protocol that you're already using. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Paul Hoffman, please. So um, I would like to mix what Tiru said with what Martin said, which is that there may be a um, hierarchy of precedence of which ones we suggest people use. And in that hierarchy, um, there, there may only, you, the user at the moment, may only have one possibility. Um, so I, I think that the idea of um, doing everything in DHCP or doing everything in the resolver or whatever is, is probably not good and we can easily de describe multiple things and then the working group can say the order that, you know, because of the attacks that we are concerned with and how many we are concerned with and as Ecker keeps bringing up, how good we expect, you know, what percentage of users we expect to be able to um, use any solution um, can be prioritized in a start with this if you can do it, great. If you can't, then go to this. Um, that seems like a reasonable model that we don't have to start with. We aren't going to know all of these initially, but if we assume, as Chiro said, that um, we're, we're going to have more than one, I think that that's a reasonable way to move forward. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Glenn Dean, please. Um, so one comment I would like to make, not wearing a chair hat, it might be useful for people who are concerned about specific DHCP attack scenarios. And I think um, Warren made some very good points. If, if you don't think the Warren's sort of uh, observation of what you need to actually make that successful helps limit the, the, the attack service, um, maybe you could post the list, um, you know, references to documented attacks so that the, the larger group can understand uh, your concerns better. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Glenn. Tiro, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I, I think in addition to considering the insecure discovery mechanisms like DHCP or especially as domain, right? I think I think the question 
of our trap with regard to cryptographic assertions. But if you look at the work happening in RAT working group with regard to cryptographic assertions, similar to the way uh, I think Firefox and Chrome uh, have uh, pre-configured uh, public resolvers in the browsers, which they have done quite a few, quite an amount of uh, background verification before adding them into that. That background verification with some cryptographic assertions proving that uh, it's an uh, legitimate organization, right? Would would reduce the attack vectors to some extent, where an attacker could easily, for example, get a self signed certificate and say, "Hey, I am an uh, uh, encrypted. I'm hosting." It. Uh, it may not able, it may not be able to solve all the attack vectors, but it definitely reduces the uh, the easy attacks that an attacker could launch, claiming to be uh, uh, hosting uh, an uh, encrypted resolver from an uh, uh, organization and uh, asking the users to connect to it. Thank you, Tiru. And um, that is the current end of the queue. And Glenn and I had been talking on the side to um, uh, take a break right at the top of the hour. And we're three minutes short of the hour. So uh, with the queue having been run for the moment, um, good time to get some coffee, um, You know, gather your thoughts for what you want to bring to the mic next. And um, we will see you at 10 after the hour. Thank you. So this is Warren. I wasn't paying attention. When are we coming back? What time after the hour? 10 minutes after the hour. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And apologies for not using plus Q, minus Q. I figured there's nobody doing actual stuff. So, Warren, you are looking at the screen, aren't you? I would have ignored your attempt to. Yes, but it says, it says 10 minute break. Right. If you didn't know when that started. Right. Close. And and in fact, it's going to be a 13 minute break. So. I got sucked down the rabbit hole of buying replacement bits for my espresso machine because. Because something. And I'm sure everybody needed to know that. I did. Oh, excellent. How are you? You must tell us more about your espresso machine. Oh dear! Now you go <laughs> down the down the rabbit hole. No, up. don't get him started. I will remind that everybody that, that that the we're, we are rec being recorded. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, I've got one of the decent espresso decent machines, and no affiliation, etc. Blah blah blah. You know, especially seeing as we're being recorded. They work really well, and I'm really happy with it. Um, however, it's now getting a little bit. Um, so, the group head gasket is starting to get old and dry, so I'm getting a replacement one of those. Okay. Um, I ha have actually had to do a couple of repairs on it because I got one of the very, very, very first 
models or you know instances. I think it's like serial number seven or something. Um, but what's incredibly nice about them is they've made improvements over time. And so I got an email being like, here is a list of things which we've upgraded. Give us your address and we will ship them to you. Oh. Um, and this included a bunch of like little things like the spring that holds the filter in the porter filter, um, upgraded flow meters. Um, oh. yeah, I can't remember what, but it was. It sounds like it's digital. Bits. Is it one of those oh, IoT, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of those IoT smart things? Yeah, I mean, it is. Um, what is host name? So what it is, is it runs, um, it's got an Android tablet attached to the top of it, and then they've replaced oh, the wow. UI with their own thing. It's actually written in Tickle and all of the sources available online. So you can oh. putz with it yourself. But what's nice is they've got a um, PID control right, 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 right at the head. So they've got a heating element right in the head itself and a PID like temperature or you know a thermistor right next to it and then a um they do pwm to control the pump itself so the machine will actually emulate a whole bunch of different other machines um they can you know provide the same temperature um and flow profiles for a bunch uh, of different i'm machines laughing because i'm imagining i'm imagining that your espresso machine can emulate like your toaster <laughs> or can you know can like, you know <laughs> with enough cpu it can also be a refrigerator you know yep <laughs> i'm asking because my wife I... my wife's favorite machine broke on her and she, is something subtle inside of it involving the pump right and okay. and um we've never found anybody to fix it successfully we have been through two additional machines each one of which have are functional, but don't work anywhere as near as the first one did when it when it was working. And the the original one is sitting there, neck in you know next to the cupboard, you know, forlornly waiting for someone to figure out how. I can't even figure out how to take it apart. Let what alone what brand machine is it? I have to go upstairs and look because I'm not the espresso genius. But I'll 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 okay. I'll I'll, I'll, but, I'll ask you for your details, Unicast. But I'm just, yeah. you know, I mean, it's a good conversation for the break since I've already had two coffees and I shouldn't have any more yeah i mean these machines are not cheap but they are really 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 nice um it was originally actually a kickstarter where the original person ran off with everybody's money it was originally cpm espresso sorry allegedly ran off with everyone's money um there was a whole thing on wired on it i but never got my cooler that, either yeah after that collapsed um somebody new came in and bought the IPR or something, I can't remember the exact exact sequence of events and gave all the original backers a good discount. Um, he's a really nice, like incredibly friendly sort of community feel to it. Um, but yeah, because, like by far good. the nicest espresso machine I've ever seen or played with. Um, so thank you for the information. No worries. I mean, as I say, mine's a really old one at this point. Um, I'm having a bit of trouble with the USB port. And so I contacted them and it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the earlier ones had weird issues with USB cables. We'll just ship you a new one. It's all good. Um, someone's unmuted in the background. Just mentioning in case they say something embarrassing. Actually, I should have kept quiet in case they say something embarrassing. Look to see who's talking anyway, so you can in the uh, participants. Congratulations on still being awake, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the dogs wake me at six in the morning, so it's now 18 hours after the dogs have woken me up, and they wake me every morning about at dawn, so I don't need, I don't need an alarm like? clock. Oh, it's lovely. What's the weather oh. like over there? It's been lovely. Um, 
it's, it's just about t-shirt weather at night so oh um, excellent and i'm guessing unlike the west coast your sky is not dark red at the moment <laughs> yeah my my um my sky is nice and clear had a good look at the Southern Cross tonight. Uh, oh. I'm a cub leader, so had a cub meeting tonight. Well, actually, had two cub meetings. And we're those are still we're happening in person? Yeah, yeah. We're allowed to have 20 people at a time. Okay. Um, so the cub pack is a little over 20 so rather than having a one hour and a half meeting we have two one hour meetings back to back um, okay so and how's the covid situation in melbourne because it's, it's as i remember that was not good it's it appears to be coming under control um the numbers are coming down nowhere like they're, they're nowhere near what they are in the US, but yeah. Yeah, well, US. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, uh, yay, America! Sorry. But, you know, the world always <laughs> needs a, um, what is it, like a reference of, like, you know, there's ways <laughs> of doing it right, and there's ways of doing it wrong, so you have the A-B test. <laughs> ah. We're the America, cool. America is the B test. <laughs> We're the control group. What would have happened if you had not Oh my people god, people. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, well, New South Wales, we're, we're getting reports, the whole state, usually uh, single digits each day of, hmm. of new reports, and about half of them usually returning travellers from somewhere overseas. They're all going into quarantine hotels for 14 days um at their expense so to travel out of australia at the moment first of all you've got to get permission to go leave the country and then to come back in you've got to be able to find a flight because they're only bringing in five or six hundred a week or something like that and then you've got to pony up about five thousand dollars for your two weeks of 5,000 flights for your two weeks of quarantine, hotel quarantine. So um, at this rate, I'm not getting to another ATF until either either there's a vaccine or a hell of a lot more people in the world have had it and there's herd immunity. So Mark, you, you are obligated to go into one of these designated quarantine hotels? Uh, as opposed to in Canada, you promise that you're going to quarantine and they check on you daily, but you can do it at your own house if, you know. No, no, you no, the, you don't get a choice. Okay, you so are, interesting. And I, wonder, I wondered if hotels would start offering that facility, but obviously in Australia they were obligated to, or they were. Yeah, the, the uh, government, the state governments um, have booked hotels um, but we have to pay, you have to pay for the um, privilege. And... I mean, it seems like that's, a, like, if I was running a hotel, it seems like that would be a great way to keep my hotel full and potentially, like, I could bump the rates up somewhat. Maybe, no. Because it's people so are going to find it on price line. No, the, it, the, it doesn't the, work like that. The rate is the same regardless of whether you're in a um, two-star hotel okay. or a five-star hotel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you're lucky, you get a five star hotel with a lo lovely view of Sydney Harbour. Okay, guys, I'm glad we've gotten our uh, hallway chat in, but now we're ringing the bell and going to resume. Okay. Well, in particular, I've uh, checked in the hallway and, and all the cookies have been eaten. And yeah. so I'm going to start eating. And we are all now fatter. So, um, I think that was a pretty good conversation from what I've seen in, in checking through the notes and, and hearing sort of the direction it took. Uh, I feel like we made progress uh, in capturing a lot of issues. And uh, uh, compared to what I saw on the list uh, over the last six months to eight months where the issue of DHCP came up, 
I think this actually was pretty successful in drilling down into the nitty gritty parts of it and uh, people's concerns. So I'm very happy with that. Um, I would suggest we seem to have sort of come to a close on that local discovery and model discussion. Thank you, Ecker, for raising it. Uh, it was a very good question to get things started with. So, um, let us move then back to the what was the first question, uh, and, and I think we've covered this somewhat, but let's just close out on it. Can DHCP play a role in discovery? They're a very simple question um, to, to the group to discuss. And I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this because we've already spent a, a good amount of discussion already. But just that simple question, if people would like to weigh in, do you think DHCP can play a role in discovery successfully? Okay, um, excellent question. But before you even asked it, Vinny had joined the queue. Yeah, sorry. Uh Let's just move forward. I I, uh, I had a question for clarification uh, earlier. Let's go ahead and move forward. Okay. So queue is wide open. Paul Waters, please. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Paul. You, you asked the question, can these people play oh, a okay. role? But my answer was yes. <laughs> Understood now. Okay. Are we, are we about to get a long line of this? Possibly. Uh, Jim Reed well, is this, this, And this is not meant to be a vote. This is just to try to sort of get people to wait. Right. We're trying to get a sense of the room. Heck no. Right. Yes. We don't even have the humming tool. Jim Reed says yes. Um, yeah. Mark and Ralph. security Saber. considerations, but yes, it can't be a role. Okay, so here's the thing: the the most negative response so far, and I, and I don't mean to characterize it as negative, but Ecker's given us a maybe. Everybody else, so it sounds like at least we're pushing in the direction. Of, it's worth discussing, unless you know somebody starts getting violently opposed to it, then then we will have to consider that. <laughs> um, and Dan Geist has joined the queue, please. So, well, actually, I skipped over Mike. Mike, I, Mike Bishop, I, I didn't know if you were just saying yes also. <laughs> so, Mike, if you have something more to say, please contribute it now. It's a yes, but. Okay. So, I think it can certainly play a role. The issue is that anything we stuff in DHCP, and I don't think we're going to get authenticated DHCP in this group. I don't think we should be pursuing that. Uh then anything in the DHCP is no more trusted than what we have today. So I think it can play a role in discovery, but I think we also need to think about what is that security model that we've been talking about? What benefit do we actually get? And is DHCP the right tool to start? With? I'm not sure it's where we should start, but I think it can play a role. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. And then skipping over all the yes that just got in uh, chat. Now it's uh, Dan Geist, please. Um, Warren, you're watchmaking or something? <laughs> that wasn't me. Okay. I, I would echo what Mike said that I think the HCP is absolutely a good option. And there are caveats, obviously, grains of salt, et cetera. And it may not provide the security level in every circumstance and every use case. But I think that to the point made in the previous session, uh, if we're trying to solve every use case, we won't ever get anything done. Um, and if we have a reasonable level of expectation of security with DHCP today, then we should at least explore what's uh, required to do DOA to DOT or any resolver discovery that way. Thank you, Dan. Tommy Pauly. Yeah, so the short answer I have is yes, because if, you know, as I stated earlier, the, the guarantee that I want to get is that whatever discovery mechanism we have is no worse than what we get from DHCP. Putting it in DHCP is obviously no worse than that. Um, but I think as several people have commented on Jabber, 
there's a but there, and I, I think it's not something we should necessarily focus too much time on because it seems fairly simple to add in there and it for more like deployment model reasons and upgrading boxes. Um, it doesn't seem like it'll give us the widest spread benefit um, short term, so we should probably certainly define it, but we should focus on other mechanisms that will help us deploy sooner first. Thank you, Tommy. Eric Orth, please. <laughs> yeah, I'm another yes, but I'm sure DHCP has a pretty strong role and can be used in a lot of different mechanisms use cases, but also we should keep in mind that DHCP can't be the only mechanism or the root of all of our mechanisms, stuff like that, because a lot of the clients are in different positions. And just speaking for Chrome, it's Chrome doesn't currently look at DHCP. I don't see us likely looking at DHCP in the general cases. We've, we're have we doing other stuff like just getting the configuration from the OS and sure indirectly that's DHCP because oftentimes it gets it from DHCP, but other times not. And so we can't assume that DHCP will be the, the root of all solutions. It's just gonna be one part of the problem and different clients are gonna have different needs and be gonna need to get their discovery information from different sources. Hey, hey uh, Glenn here, jumping in with my chair hat. So, Eric, let me ask for a clarification on that. So, uh, I, I get it, the, you know, what, what you said about Chrome. And I'm wondering, is there one of the issues being that we have some, some of the space being the application, which doesn't see DHCP messages, it's separated out from that um, versus uh, other implementations, which might be at the operating system level, which then potentially could have a much more interaction with DHCP. Is that sort of those different modalities giving some of the, the, the concern here maybe? I, I don't know if it'll be 100%, but there's probably a very strong correlation that applications are probably more likely to be interested in one thing, OS is another, but I'm sure it can come down to specifics of the use case of the individual client, whatever it is. Like some clients, even if they're in the application space, yeah, sure we could look at DHCP, but just for various reasons and various policies that are obviously out of scope for this group, the client may choose, choose not to. And it comes down to the individual case for the client. So clients are gonna need different solutions and some clients aren't gonna wanna look at DHCP. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric and Glenn. Move oh, on. I'll, I'll say thank you to Eric. Uh, Martin Thompson, please. Yeah, so Tommy said most of what I was going to say. Um, I think Eric touched on one of the reasons that I, I think DHCP, though it might be an easy win, will be insufficient. Um, that being that uh, applications might not be able to get it. Um, the other reason that uh, clients may not be able to get DHCP is the prevalence of forwarders and uh, those those little boxes that don't get updated. That that won't be passing on DHCP options or other configuration options from upstream. So I have a box that pulls its configuration over PPPOA, maybe it might be OE, I can't remember which. Um, and unless we both modify that protocol and modify the box, we're not gonna be propagating that information down. So um, I would say yes, but like it, many others. Okay, thank you, Martin. Kiru, please. Uh, as to DHCP, I think DHCP can be supplemented with other mechanisms like uh, uh, trust on first use, so that uh, some of the attacks that have been discussing that later when an uh, um, internal attack happens, at least uh, there would be a way for client to identify that, so assuming um, an attacker typically is not always on path and may keep in later due to some vulnerability. I, I, I think trust on first use would help at least identify and detect some of those threats. Thank you. Thank you, Kiru. Paul Waters, please. So, for most networks that you connect to, DHCP is as secure as the entire network. Like most Wi-Fi networks are now segmented. You, you can't like spoof your fellow participant on a network. So basically, if I join a Starbucks network, um, I can trust as much as I can trust a random Starbucks network, I can trust the random DHCP server to give me a hint. And that hint can then later be used for 
you know, uh, me making a decision whether or not I'm going to give that network enough trust for, for my um, encrypted DNS or whether I will try to, you know, use the network only to relay encrypted packets and, and just use it as a transport layer and not trust it for anything. So I think it's useful to for the network to be able to give out that information, whether trusted or not, is completely independent of, of that decision. Thank you, Paul. Tommy Jensen. Thank you. Uh, so actually, Paul just touched on the ones I wanted to bring up, which is yes, but um, information coming over DHCP should not be used to change the trust level of a server. Um, it's a convenience that can be used to advertise the metadata necessary to connect to an encrypted DNS server. Um, and that will help protect against late arriving attackers to a network, um, among other things. But we shouldn't be using DHCP as a way to convey information that we will then use to establish greater trust than we had before. Just to jump in and answer that. Um, so th that all comes down to whether you trust that network or not, right? Yep, exactly. Yep. And that, that was true before, and it would continue to be true after we build a DHCP based mechanism for connecting to an encrypted DNS server. Right. Great. Um, thank you. Paul Hoffman. So to pile on and maybe cut this a little bit shorter, does everyone agree that we are, that, you know, all, do all the people who are saying yes or yes, but agree that um, D, any use of DHCP will be insecure unauthenticated use of DHCP, because if so, I think we can just move on. Oh, sorry. You mean that the information that DHCP gives you might be unauthenticated, but it might still be a hint to get to an authenticated source. Exactly right. Exactly right. That is that we are not, since a few people have said, oh, I don't know if we can add, you know, secure, you know, make DHCP more secure or whatever, that we simply say, we're not going to try and therefore we know already know exactly the level of trust. Yes, I think I think you're right. There's no point in securing the DHCP. Okay. Um, thank you for that exchange, uh, Jim Reed. Please. Thanks, Dale. Uh, just a clarification. An earlier speaker talked about the security model. I think we need to be careful here that we're realizing there's not going to be a single overarching security model or security solution to all this discovery stuff. So there may well be one that applies for the, for the DHCP use case, but there'll be another security model for some other kind of discovery mechanism, whatever that might be. So I think we should be very, very careful about how we're, we're talking about these things because we may be getting ourselves in this trap yet again of trying to look for an overarching solution for a general thing, which probably is unachievable. And we should maybe recognize that there will be multiple security models or multiple threat models, depending on the individual use cases or potential scenarios that, that could be looked at. And so I think we should be careful to capture that information, make sure that we all understand we're working towards the same thing. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Daniel Miguel. Yeah, so um, considering the the responses from um, from uh, uh, whether DHCP should be included or not, um, I think I'd like to echo um, what um, Eric Ort uh, just mentioned is that, yeah, I, I see um, DHCP as a way to, to carry some bootstrapping information to perform a discovery protocol rather than being uh, completely um, uh, part of that discovery protocol itself. So, um, in that sense, I mean, uh, we should um, have a discovery protocol that can be provisioned with DHCP or uh, some other mechanisms um, like reading uh, directly in the OS. Or um, so that's that's what I'm. I'd like to say that um, DHCP should not be a completely banned from bootstrapping a discovery protocol but um, it should not be the only mechanism as well. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and I believe that uh, there's some other messages interspersed here, but if you, 
If you think you were in the queue and I have somehow missed you, please um, uh, add yourself to the queue again. Otherwise, we're at the end of the current queue, but we might at least be getting some direction as to um, starting to have a more meaningful, perhaps not right now, DHCP conversation. Okay, Glenn, I'm not seeing anyone else uh, queuing on this topic right now. And um, we have a slightly over an hour of our scheduled time left. Um, Glenn, please pick up where you want to head next. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and so to, to that comment, I, I think uh, these uh, discussing topics like this can be kind of exhausting, uh, especially not in person. So I think we should probably limit today's session to only two hours and, and, and let certain um, participants get, a, get an extra half hour of sleep, maybe. Um, so we seem to cover DHCP very well. Uh, I think we've, in fact, in the last conversation here just now, um, touched upon uh, the whole second part of that question, which what authentication does the work feel is needed? Uh, and, and, and Paul, I think, made some great comments. Paul Hoffman made some great comments on that. So let's move on to sort of jump it away from DHCP discovery. Let's talk about authentication. The next question, which is question number two on the slide. What is authentication's role in resolver discovery and validation? So the DHCP and the network bootstrapping aside, uh, would people like to comment on what they feel is the uh, the needed role here uh, as part of the discovery and validation process uh, of successfully selecting, not selecting, but you know what I mean, like successfully discovering and then making a choice uh, ultimately on what resolvers you will talk to. What do you see as authentication's role in that or the need for it? And by the way, the answer maybe don't need any, it's already taken care of in the protocol. Uh, when you right. do other validations. So, Glenn, you know those moments when we're in a live meeting and half the room stands up to join the mic line when somebody says something? <laughs> uh, Paul Hoffman, please start it off. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with an apology because um, th this question that says, you know, what is the role in discovery and validation? For those of you who aren't completely native English speakers, it sounds like Discovery and validation are one thing there, and that's partially due to um, the draft that Puneet and I put in. One thing that's completely clear to me now, and I apologize for not having seen it ahead of time, is those two are completely different topics or can be separated by people more careful than I was. And we should not discuss them. We should not discuss the role for discovery and validation. We should discuss authentication's role for discovery and authentication's role for validation. So please separate them out. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Martin Thompson. So I, th I think that, that Ben Schwartz hit on this during the, the lengthy discussion that we had previously, which is that um, if, we, if there are, is any authentication involved in this process, then that authentication is in, involved to the extent that it is necessary to prevent an attacker from gaining additional privileges that would not otherwise be available to them. So um, in the DHCP case, I don't think that there's any pressing need to add uh, additional authentication other than what is provided in the, in the configuration protocol. But um, in the case where we look to alternative solutions, such as those that might use uh, talking to the resolver itself, then we might need to, to examine authentication for the purposes of ensuring that the DNS interactions aren't tampered with because the DNS interactions become a critical part of the discovery process. Thank you, Martin. Uh, ben, please. Ben? I was transcribing Martin's comment. Okay. Uh, but I think Ecker is ahead of me in the queue. Uh, he dropped. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think that one, one way that might help to think about this is uh, to think about this as maintaining a uh, maintaining certain invariants. Um, so Essentially, DHCP 
gives us certain properties. Uh, and uh, I think that authentication, one role that authentication can play is to essentially make sure that we don't violate those properties. I think about this, uh, I like Ecker's formulation that uh, we're looking for solutions that can make things better and can't make things worse. Um, so can't make things worse. That's, that's I think, an important role for authentication. And then uh, another role that I haven't heard discussed about authentication is about use cases where the client wishes to surface an identity to the user, um, or in some cases where the user has actually specified an identity, but especially in, in cases where uh, where the network has um, has encountered some resolver and the user would like to know what resolver am I using. Um, in order to, it, for most user interfaces today don't make any great attempt to answer that question, but if we really want to answer that securely, then we need some kind of authenticated identity for the resolver itself. Is that it, Ben? Yep, that's all. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And Tommy Jensen, please. Thank you. So I think Paul was right in separating these as separate topics. Um, and so I'll answer my opinion to each. Uh, I don't believe that authentication plays a role in discovery um, because discovery today is unauthenticated. And I think to add um, authentication to discovery um, implies that we're authenticating that someone is advertising a a specific server um i don't think that's a road to success having said that um part of validation to me is if i discover a server um that is a classic dns server validating that it when i talk to it and it and i bootstrap our way into an encrypted connection validating that the original server I was talking to and the encrypted connection I now have were the same um, is important and authentication plays a role there. Great, uh, thank you, Tommy. Tommy Pauly. Hi, yeah, so I agree with Tommy Jensen. Um, I think the authentication is for validation, not for discovery. And I think what we need to validate is the identity of the resolver that we got from whatever provisioning mechanism we had. So that could be the user's choice, like they typed in 8.8.8.8 into their DNS settings, or it came from a provisioning protocol like DHCP. And if the thing that we already know, if that identity is a name or like the URL template for Doe, we don't have to do anything more because Doe and Dot already take care of that. The cases we're interested in here are the ones where we are provisioned only with an address. And in that case, we need to authenticate some, we need to authenticate that address. Um, and so we can have other hints for the URI templates or the ports or whatever else we need for DOE or DOT. But what we need to authenticate during the validation step is the identity that we originally got, which could just be an address like someone had typed in quad eight or I had some address from DHCP. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Ecker, please. Yeah, I think I largely what Tom was saying. I guess I, I, I try to phrase it a little differently, perhaps, but I think it comes down to the same thing, which is that for the purpose of this discussion, we are treating whatever DHCP tells you as authenticated. And so DHCP can tell you anything at once, including like a full like URI template or including like, you know, um, or whatever. And then we can fall back to like, and so, and so we can assume we can fall back to whatever conventional authentication methods we'd have, um, you know, if, if you've been given a URI template, for instance. Um, the, the more interesting problem is the situation where what's been fed into the system, um, because I mean, I'm, I'm taking as part of this discussion, as Tommy said, that what, that, that, that if DHC is compromised, you're already, you're already host. Um, the, um, the more interesting question is, as Tommy says, when you were given a, um, uh, an IP address and 
um, which is basically the only thing you're, you're given otherwise, you're given it otherwise. And then how to, how to establish that the person you're talking to is the same, is in some sense, the same person or controlled by the same people or the same origin or whatever, as the um, thing that would have been associated with the DOE 53 endpoint. Um, I do want to, um, I do want to push back slightly, Tommy, on the suggestion that, um, that, that should include being able to like have having malleability in the URI template because I can imagine some serious problems there. Um, but uh, I think otherwise, point. I'm generally on board with what you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think I think I don't I don't I don't yet I'm not yet sure I understand how to establish that they're the same person. Though I I do think that the suggestion of having a certificate with a SAN that has the same IP has somewhat compelling. Though of course it doesn't work with um, 1918 addresses. Thank you, Ecker. Ralph Weber, please. Um, yeah, for uh, um, in-band uh, kind of authentication, we could also think about something token-based. But uh, one thing I wanted to uh, stress is we are talking about DHCP, but uh, just to be precise, I assume we're also including IPv6 route announcement and maybe also provisioning domains as sort of a local bootstrap mechanisms here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Paul Hoffman, please. So uh, thank you, Ecker. I got in the queue, um, but to say something similar, specifically about IP address, you know, since the question is authentication with IP addresses. Um, when Puneet and I had proposed the res info stuff earlier. One of the things we got beaten up on very, fairly quickly was, oh, well, there are no CAs that, you know, issue certs for IP addresses, um, which isn't true, but it's also, it is approximately true. Um, and some IP addresses you can never get a certificate for because they are in the private address space, which is absolutely true. Um, this goes back to Ecker's question how much of a solution do we want? You know, like like if it covers n percent, are we are we good enough? Um, and it it also I think speaks to where are the trust anchors, because today, as far as I can tell, you can get um, web PKI certificates with IP addresses from a very small number of certificate authorities. Um, that number is likely to grow and not shrink but it is a small subset of the pile of certs that a browser has. Um, operating systems, some operating systems have piles the same size as the browsers, some have much smaller piles. So this is really going to come down to where are our trust anchors. Um, I think we can still move forwards with it, and I think that it, in, personally, I am okay with a, um, solution, a DNS-based solution that excludes if your um, if your resolver has a private address space. In the same way that, quite frankly, that resolver will also likely have names in it that are not resolvable in the full DNS and such. I think we I, I think we have to buy into the idea that private is private and then move on. Great, thank you, Paul. Vittorio, please. Thanks. Well, I, I would just add a comment on, on the question about authentication, which is that uh, you really need to define uh, authentication of what. I mean, it, it uh, and this unfortunately changes depending on what uh, your deployment model is, because uh, if your model is that uh, you get a, a DOH URI or a, an IP address from the user or from the client itself, then of course you need to authenticate that you are speaking to actually to that uh, address or to or to that uh, URI. But in the same provider auto upgrade uh, deployment model, what you need to authenticate is just that you are actually talking to the same entity which uh, was running the unencrypted un resolver. You don't really know to identify who they are or to know who is actually running the, 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 that couple of resolvers. And in that case, the, the solution might be uh, even technically slightly different from a solution you would employ to authenticate the, the identity of who is running a resolver or the fact that it's actually responding to a certain uh, IP address. So yeah, I, I think we, we we might need uh, going forward to separate and the, the two questions. So I mean, authenticating the uh, the identity versus authenticating the relationship. Okay, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Vittorio. And I will note that we currently have two people in the queue, but we're intending to close the queue right after Daniel. So if you do have a last minute, um, because Glenn wants to cover just a few more things before the end of the meeting. Um, but I'll give a chance if somebody needs to slide in under the wire. Uh, Kiru, please. Uh, I, I would prefer names for authentication than IP addresses because uh, IP addresses keep changing because we're seeing quite a few places where ISPs keep changing your IPv6 addresses quite often. So if you have these uh, v6 addresses, it's quite uh, uh, difficult uh, to again uh, uh, reacquire certs, and especially with regard to uh, uh, talking to CA and getting a cert using uh, Acme. And the other problem is uh, what I see is that uh, if there is a name, it's, it's very easy for the user to identify. Say if it's my, it's provided by my uh, network security vendor. Or it's provided by my ISP. Rather, if it is just an IP address, uh, uh, the user may not be able to relate to the, who is providing the uh, DNS resolver. Thank you, Tira. Daniel, please. So, well, I, I'd like to echo what um, Victorio um, just mentioned is that the question is, um, I mean, this to me is not that clear. And um, so I might respond um, out of scuff, but um, in a word, what I'd like to mention is that I believe that the discovery protocol sh should be based on um, authenticated um, information because then, I mean, the, the purpose of the discovery is to be able to proceed to a selection. Um, that said, how we bootstrap that discovery might rely, uh, if we have no other cases, or no other um, options rely on non-authenticated um, um, information. So that's my um, what how I perceive the things. Okay, thank you, Daniel. And Ecker will get the last word on this topic before Glenn shuffles us off to the next. So, I, mean, I think that the I want to focus briefly on the case where um, you're unable to use DHCP for provisioning. So in that case, you have whatever provisioning information you have, which in this case is an IP address. So it's either, um, sorry, for additional provisioning. So either you have a DHCP supplied IP address, or you have someone typed in eight 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 into their into their you know, um, uh, in, 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 into their uh, uh, um, you know computer or whatever, right? And so um, in that case, it seems to me that there are there are roughly speaking, um, you know, two scenarios, right? One is you have a trustworthy catalog. Of people of IP addresses, which actually will run DO and DOT resolvers, um, and the other is you do not. Um, and the case where you have to determine in band whether or not um, this IP address determines DO and DOT resolvers, you're necessarily exposed to downgrade attacks um, from the attacker who controls the DNS. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the 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 the, 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 the Path here is IP address. Um, determine whether or not DO is DOT supported, and then and then and then and then connect with DO and DOT and try to authenticate. Um, but um, it's important to think about exactly which paths which paths you're attempting to block for the attacker from doing. And as far as I can tell, um, unless you have an outband out band mechanism like the same provider or upgrade mechanism that Google and um, and Microsoft are using, it's not possible to run downgrade attacks by um, an attacker controls the DNS the the, the uh, local network. Um, so we'll probably just have to live with that unless someone has figured thing out that happened. Thank you, Ecker. Over to you, Glenn. Okay, well, that was some very good conversation. Thank you. Uh, I, I also, being cognizant of the time, I'm trying to move us along. So, um, of course, we can continue these discussions on lists, and, and, and we should. I'd like to uh, move on to question number three and, and a little bit of question number four. Um, this notion that uh, there would be some affiliation or association uh, around uh, resolvers, uh, different resolvers, uh, it, it keeps coming up. It's come up in this conversation just, just now. Uh, so I'd like to spend a few minutes getting the group's thoughts on what they see as, uh, is, is that something that's needed? And it, it, what role would authentication play in that? Since obviously if you're going to, uh, trust that affiliation that association you in some way will need to uh authenticate that so uh and if you want to also drift into a little bit of the question number four and they are broken out by uh, suggestion by victorio that there really is two questions here there is this affiliation notion uh but then the other question is is uh, are you affiliating at the organization level 
Are you affiliated just at the server level or is it affiliation across different orgs where you might have uh, this org says, I trust that other org. So let's put these, these notions together and discuss. Okay, uh, Ben Schwartz, please. Hi. Uh, so I'm going to use the word DHCP here, but I don't mean DHCP specifically. Uh, I, I mean something more general about uh, about authentication and, and discovery flows. I think that we don't need this inside DHCP. That is, uh, I see no reason why we should require that there's an affiliation between some described resolver inside DHCP and some other resolver also described inside DHCP. We don't have that constraint today. DHCP is capable of carrying a collection of unrelated resolvers. I think where we want this kind of constraint is when we are trying to do uh, some sort of in-band post DHCP upgrade. And the reason we want this constraint is related to specific attack models where we believe there is an attacker who could divert us to a an incorrect resolver and we are essentially trying to use dhcp as a a temporary route of trust to say okay we'll use any resolver as long as we can trace it back into the dhcp as long as it's essentially no worse than we would have done from the dhcp source uh, so that's what I think we're up to here. And I think that my favorite solution so far is to say effectively, uh, if we're starting from an only an IP address from our configuration source, whatever that might be, then you have to uh, prove that you are equivalent to that IP address. And you could do that through a PKI, or you could also do it by being on that IP address. Um, so for the RFC 1918 case, uh, you don't have to get a certificate for your RFC 1918 address. You just have to operate on that address. Thank you, Ben. Martin, please. Yeah, I'm just going to plus one most of basically everything except uh, the Ben said, except the last bit, which I'm going to think about a little bit longer. Um, I think the the reason that we that we might want or i might suggest even need that association is to deal with um, to deal with attacks and nothing more if otherwise if we're looking at the configuration protocol we're just asking the network's opinion about what the resolver is and there's no need for an association between different types of resolvers when that is our root of trust thank you martin vittorio please Yes, well, I, I am especially interested in this question because I think uh, if, if you reduce it to the question, I mean, uh, authenticating a relationship between a, a currently configured DO53 resolver and its DOH equivalent that you need to discover, and then this is what suits the currently, let's say, leading deployment model, the one that has been employed by Google and Microsoft. So uh, I think it, that if we could find a way to make this work, even in, through a short-term solution, which is still secure, then we, we could make a step forward in deployment pretty quickly. And then uh, in parallel, of course, we can devise more general me methods or methods for other use cases or so on. But uh, I mean, in, I think that uh, you can do this. I mean, you can authenticate this relationship securely using DNSSEC and TLSA and a number of existing technologies. And so I, I would focus on this as one of the uh, most immediate use cases that could actually find deployment in, in the real world. Grazie. Andrew, can please? Uh, well, actually, uh, Vittorio has pretty much preempted most of what I was going to say. So I just re reiterate, I think, same provider auto upgrade, I think, is where this is particularly uh, important. But uh, the rest has been covered by others, so I'll stop there. OK, thank you, Andrew. Kiru, please. Uh, if if uh, uh, this is giving you a domain name, I think I think I think if it's hosted on the same IP address as Devo fifty eight, it just uh, uh, solves two problems. One is that uh, there is no need to perform another lookup to find out the IP address of the encrypted DNS server, 
And the second problem it resolves is finding the association whether these two are uh, uh, affiliated or not. So I, I think hosting them on the same IP address makes it quite simple and uh, addresses uh, uh, several of the attacks that were discussed here. Great, thank you, Tiru. Eric, uh, Ecker, please. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I mean, Tommy and I were having a chat back and forth um, on uh, on on Java with this. Um, um, I think you know this once again. This goes back to attacker model, um, uh, and in particular, we talk um, the, the the point um, that Ben raised about um, the local IP addresses. Um, I, I I've not yet heard any mechanism that will allow you to authenticate um, plausibly authenticate the local IP address um, resolver in, in, in a good way. Um, um, that maybe perhaps you could invent one. Um, uh, so if the question is: Is it what, what, what's the value proposition of having a secure connection to the local resolver if you can't authenticate it um, in a way that ties back to itself? That ties back to the, the DOE 3 address we wrote initially. Um, it may have some value, but it depends. I won't have to really flesh out what the attack model was. Thank you, Ecker. Eric. Yeah, I just want to comment quickly on the, the comments that it would be an interesting validation of the, the relationship that the DOE server is on the same IP address as the IP address that was used for the other stuff. Um, yes, that's probably a good mechanism in some cases, but we have to keep in mind it's not the only solution because I keep hearing there's plenty of situations where it can't be hosted on the same IP for various reasons, maybe different server, maybe I don't know. I think a lot of it comes into stuff around just routers, acting with resolvers, and things like that. But we we still it's still an unsolved problem for the other cases where they can't be at the same IP. We still need some way to validate the relationship, whether that means figuring out the identity of the IP address and validating that, and then matching it against the validation of the do or dot server, or some other mechanism of validating just the pure relationship. I think there's still room for more solutions in that space. So, Glenn here, I'd like to jump in and ask a clarification to both Eric and, and, and Ecker. Um, what, what, have you considered, when you're in these statements you just made, the potential, and I don't know anybody's doing this, and I don't know why anybody would want to do it, but that doesn't mean somebody won't, uh, where we might have a DOE server uh, hosted uh, on uh, the same IP address, but at different URLs, uh, because they're providing different levels of DOE service uh, off of the same server infrastructure, but they might have different URLs, so as to I don't know maybe have one that's uh, you know malware filtered and one that's completely unfiltered. How does that play into when you talk about IP addresses and and your d discussion? I mean, I think in this case you're you're using the fact that it's on the same IP address as a proxy for the the relationship that the the do URL is at least to some extent associated with whoever is running the classic DNS server on that IP address. So even if there's multiple URLs, yeah, this is just a case of there's multiple Doe or dot servers that are associated with it. So you still have that relationship. It's just not a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is what I was alluding to earlier with respect to um, learning the uh, URL with talking to Tommy. Um, uh, the, the key point is you cannot allow. Imagine, imagine you have a. Imagine you have two uh, uh, URLs. It's built. Imagine you have two URLs, one of which um, actually answers the question, and the other of which forwards the uh, query to the attacker for the answer to the question. So obviously, you can't allow the attacker to steer which URL you do. And I think you. I think. I think if, if we're going to have a situation in which, um, in, in which the uh, IP address is used as the lookup key for the resolver, then it would have to be the case that that deterministic object controls which URL template you use as well. And then you have to trust the do, do, do server to separate those, um, to handle those templates properly in the same way that any HTTP server has to. But yeah, you can't, you, you can't, you can't use, uh, you can't, you can't use DNS, for instance, to look up the URI template based on the IP address, because uh, then, you know, then, then the attacker can attack you again. Okay, um, uh, Atiru, uh, it's your turn at the moment. I'm not sure whether Ecker just kind of addressed or whether he's rejoining the queue on a separate topic, but let's go with Atiru for right now. I think it's very easy for an ISP or a network security provider to uh, host a, a DOH server or a, a DOT server and get a domain validated cert. 
uh, right? I mean, uh, there are various ways to automate that using Acme and uh, the ISP can get those certs and use the TR and or any other uh, secure management protocols they have to uh, provision those managed uh, routers. And uh, you, you don't really need any uh, 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 any new way of figuring out how do you get uh, uh, certificates for uh, local IP addresses. Okay, thank you, Tiro. Uh, back to you, Gwen. And there, I found the unmute button fastest so far today. Okay, well, that was some, some uh, I thought, really good discussion. And um, based upon conversations I've seen on lists, uh, uh, my sense is that this has helped clarify things significantly. Uh, and, and so that was very good. I'm looking at the time and, and we did want to get people out of here, not going to the full two and a half hours. So I am going to suggest uh, that we actually uh, carry over the other questions, number six and number seven, uh, onto on list, uh, and then also potentially for a future interim. Uh, I'd like to spend a, a, just a few minutes on number eight, which is not meant to be a, a deep discussion on authentication topics. What I'd like to understand uh, is what other authentication aspects do we need to consider so that we can have these, you know, in a bigger list uh, that can then be put onto the discussion list and, and gather broader input. So if people could just comment on uh, very briefly, what other authentication aspects need to be considered, but not going into great detail about them, please. And then, then that will be, we'll, when we've done that, we'll, we'll finish up and close out the session. Thank you. Uh, Echo, please. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if this is uh, an authentication topic or not, but as I was just saying in the chat, um, one question I think we understand is, um, is, is it important for the client to be able to discern whether it is connected to a secure, a securely discovered and securely discovered um, uh, DOS server? Or dot server. So, um, you know, at the beginning, Tommy sort of opened by saying, "Well, let's not make the situation any worse." So, that, like, you know, if you, if you could already, if, it, if you were already attacked, connected the um, to an to an insecure server, um, an attacker, then then you still are. But um, and the number of the, a number of these pro systems have the property, um, if they're designed sp under specific designs, that you might be upgraded to an encrypted connection to the sit to what you think is this they think is the same person, and actually is the same person. Actually, is the attacker, um, and um, but then, and which is fine as long as you don't treat that treat, treat that connection differently. But imagine you did things over that connection you wouldn't be willing to do otherwise. Then, um, then that would be a very bad situation. So that's, that's a probably some a probably piece of um, the the visibility authentication is important is an important question whether we care about that or not. Thank you, Ecker. Are there any other comments? I think people are starting to wind down, Glenn. <laughs> I, think, I think we're all getting a little bit burnt out. Uh, this has been a, a very intense conversation the last uh, two hours. Okay, so then um, I move that we um, move on ahead to the, 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 the closing comments by the chair. Um, oh, yeah, um, Paul Hoffman. Yeah, oh. yeah. I think Paul Paul just posted what I was about to say. Uh, yeah. Sign the attendees list. We have uh, about forty some plus people. Uh, we have about 36 right now that have signed the attendees list uh, in the etherpad. Um, so uh, I only have a couple of things to say. Uh, we, um, I, I, we're not necessarily planning on having another intern before ITF uh, in November. Uh, it, we can discuss that and see how things go, but there is a uh, the sweet spot for when we would have it, which would be near the end of October, is uh, coincident with an ICANN meeting. And given the significant overlap between the two groups, uh, I think that asking people to try to do uh, an, an interim for this and participate in ICANN uh, discussions might be a little too much uh, thing. So I suspect we'll just not have an interim between now and the next ITF meeting, but we'll have lots of discussion on the list. That's my, my yeah. bit, Dave. Well, I'll just say that one of the things that we're also um, considering and will be worthy of discussion um, is just what the structure of our next uh, meeting at the IETF uh, should look like. 
Um, you know, traditionally, many ITF meetings have been kind of presentation heavy with a little bit of discussion. Uh, but I, we have all also seen uh, groups like uh, Quip and HDP BIS run pretty effectively by running a working group meeting, much like an interim actual working group meeting. And so we'll be interested in hearing feedback about, uh, you know, how we'll be able to get the most done. Um, and I see that uh, I, I, Andrew would like to say something. It was merely in response to to that comment, uh, uh, Dave. Um, I know you've currently uh, um, requested, I think, one two hour slot for ITF one hundred and nine. Um, and I was just going to sort of suggest, may, is it worth considering requesting two and, and doing one for presentations and one purely for discussion? Just the thought. That is absolutely uh, worthy of consideration also. So we will welcome all feedback on how you think, especially as we seem to act, be coming to some conclusions about things that we can work on. You know, how will we be able to work on these things most effectively? And uh, once again, the uh, Cody link is for the attendee list has been linked a couple of times now in the WebEx chat. Um, and I think we are pretty well done here. I mean, Glenn? Uh, I think we are done. So I'd like to thank Andrew for the excellent job of watching and uh, Ben and, and uh, Chris Box. Well, and absolutely, once again, heroic note takers. Uh, I am more than impressed with how well you were able to capture a very lengthy discussion. So thank you so much to our note takers for the job that you've done. I'm sorry, I think our note takers uh, may have at one point been a court transcriber because these notes are really, really well done. Yeah, it's been nicely. Okay, uh, you're all free for breakfast or sleep or whatever you're off to next. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.